in the web browser. Yeah, I'll show you what, uh, what I'm seeing in the web browser. It's not showing me anything. Oh, there we go. In the web browser. Oh, now it's showing up. Okay. Yeah, I'll show you what, uh, what I'm seeing in the web browser. Yeah, there's a there's a delay between when it starts and when the feed gets there, so it's. Yeah, I thought the delay would be like thirty seconds, not uh, five minutes. Apparently. Okay. Okay. Well, we're almost ready for Shankar to start. There he's got video. All right. Let me know when, when I can sh start sharing, Jerry. Okay. Um, I think we got plenty of people here. And uh, yeah, whenever you feel like it, it's not like our meetings, you know, it's not like our meetings at MIT where people show up about 15 minutes after the meeting start time. Okay. So one of the things to do when you're ready to share, uh, mute everybody and then uh, do your sharing. All right, let me, let me share this. What? There we go. Okay. Um, all right. So unfortunately, I am having to do this just from my laptop. I've my second screen is being used by other family members, uh, so I can't switch between um, uh, looking at the Jitsi screen and uh, my presentation. So if there's any, if anybody has um, any questions, uh, just feel free to interrupt me. Uh, uh, if you if you type it in the chat, I may not be able to see okay. it. Um, oh, okay. Jerry, can, can you email, email the uh, the new URL out to the announce mailing list so people know about it? Hello, can everyone still hear me? Yep. Ah, okay. Yeah, we can hear you. All right, let me know when to start. Should I get started? Jerry, Jabber, is everything okay on the live stream? Uh, yes, go ahead and start. Okay. All right. Uh, it's uh, very strange to be doing it this way, but uh, I guess uh, uh, <laughs> this is better than nothing. But uh, anyway, hopefully everybody is uh, is uh, safe and okay. Um, 
Uh, so for those who don't know me, I'm, uh, I'm Shankar. I work at uh, AMD. And uh, uh, today I'll uh, sort of give you a, a quick overview of the, um, you know, the Ryzen family of products. So I don't directly work on the Ryzen line, so I can take uh, neither any blame nor credit uh, for it. Uh, you could give me credit, I'll take it, uh, but don't blame me. Uh, anyway, so let's let's uh, quickly go through kind of what I'll be talking about today. And like I said, feel free to um, interrupt me and ask me questions um, uh, anytime. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I won't be able to see the, the chat window. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the, uh, a quick kind of outline of the, of the Ryzen uh, product family. Uh, the, the nomenclature can be somewhat confusing. So I have a couple of slides that kind of explains the different uh, uh, families of products. Um, we'll talk about the Zen CPU core, uh, which is just the CPU component of all these um, um, SOCs or system on chip. Uh, we can go into a little bit more detail of the Ryzen um, um, you know, CPU architecture, especially uh, what AMD is doing with respect to uh, chiplets. And then I can talk about the Ryzen um, APUs, which is AMD's marketing term for um, uh, uh, what what it, what we call uh, accelerated processing unit, uh, which means it's both CPU and GPU um, integrated onto the same piece of silicon. So we'll talk about uh, the architecture of of those products and kind of the trade-offs uh, involved over there. Um, okay, so um, I think most uh, people must be familiar with the the general um, product line. So uh, at high level, we have desktop products, we have um, you know, mobile products by which we mean laptops, not, not phones. Um, and um, and uh, you know, uh, other form factors that are laptop-like, like two-in-one um, kind of um, devices. Um, and then there's a third category, which is Ryzen Embedded, which um, uh, you have to buy the whole appliance. They're they're sold to uh, uh, you know as uh, for for other people who build products on top of it. Um, you can't go into uh, uh, like Micro Center or Newegg and just buy a Ryzen embedded chip. Uh, it's usually only sold to other um, OEMs. So I won't be talking about much about the embedded, and for that matter, um, uh, I won't be talking much about the Threadripper um, either. Uh, but mostly focused on uh, sort of the more mainstream um, CPUs and APUs. Um, <clears throat> uh, all right, so this is the this is the uh, thing I was talking about, uh, where the where the numbering and the naming is rather confusing. Uh, oh yeah. So, sorry, was there a question? Okay. Um, so uh, you know, so we have we have sort of three um, families of products based on different uh, CPU question, core. Question, please. Yes. Um, are you are you going on to the next slides? Because we I can only see your uh, title slide with your name and date. Is everybody seeing the same okay. thing? Now I can see CPU product nomenclature. Ah, okay. Maybe if my if I did full screen, maybe it didn't refresh. Um, Sorry, did everybody have the same problem? Yeah, it's no, only just catching up now. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay, then I, I won't go full screen. I didn't know that, okay. I, no, I, we're, I was going... we're, we're seeing the uh, slide sorter on the left of the screen. Yeah, okay. Um... Yeah, so sorry. Uh, let me let me take a couple of steps back. This is this is what I was talking about. We have we have the three categories of products: desktop, mobile, and um, and embedded. Uh, and then within desktops, it can be either CPU uh, or APU. And then we have the high-end uh, sort of uh, Threadripper line. And then uh, for laptops, there are generally all APUs. Although there are some products which use the um, the regular desktop chip, but in a lower power um, configuration. Um, and then um, this is where I was, um, um, sort of the different uh, product families, uh, sorry, product um, 
groups for, for the CPU products. So these are the ones without an integrated GPU. Uh, and we have these different families of our um, Zen CPU uh, core architecture. And then the families of products are based on which version of the, of the cores uh, they are. And, uh, you know, if you look in the, um, you know, uh, external, you have all of these um, uh, sort of uh, code names for the different uh, products. So we have the evolution of the uh, CPU core going from Zen uh, to Zen Plus to Zen 2. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the, the, the CPU product families uh, based on that. So Ryzen 3, 5, or 7, um, that's loosely meant to... Um, mirror what um, you know Intel has core i3 i5 i7 um, I think this numbering scheme I was not involved in this naming uh, so but I think the these numbers are not a coincidence uh, and then you have the generation which is 1xx uh, x uh, 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 or 2 or 3 um, so and then uh, and then Threadripper those they don't have the 357 uh, but uh, they just call three Threadripper, and then it's typically uh, the generation, and then the nine next to it. Um, and then with the Zen Core, Zen Two Core family, we also have added the the Ryzen Nine series uh, products. Um, uh, so these are all uh, these are all desktop uh, products. Um, next slide here is our APUs. Uh, um, and these can be either desktop uh, or for, for laptops. And then the naming gets even more confusing because there are all these letters that go after it. Uh, so G uh, designation is for um, graphics. So that distinguishes, but if you just have two XXX, you know, that's a CPU uh, from this generation. Um, and if there's a G, um, it's, it's, um, uh, it's it's an APU with the graphics um, integrated. Uh, and if you notice, this numbering is off by one. So for these for these product nomenclatures, we have the, the classic problems of uh, computer science, uh, which are the three problems, which are uh, naming and then off by one errors. Um, so so uh, the, the, the APU family starts with two XX. There is no one XX. And uh, this has led to some confusion because um, uh, the the desktop products with the Zen 2 core have three XXX, and then but the the mobile product has four XX. Um, uh, it's a little confusing. Uh, and then if you notice, uh, most of the the more recent products um, have all transitioned to um, code names based on um, famous painters. Uh, so, you know, we had uh, uh, Matisse um, over here, and then uh, now we have Picasso and Renoir. And um, if you look at the various um, rumor sites online, um, you will see um, references to Vermeer and Cezanne. Um, I, can, I can neither confirm nor deny any of those names. But you'll find them um, if you go Google for them. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, so one kind of cool thing, uh, which, which, um, you know, if you, if you think about the amount of engineering that has gone to make this happen, this is very cool. I mean, from, from my perspective is that all these Zen, uh, based, um, desktop products that you see are all for desktops are all socket aim for compatible. And this, uh, this applies regardless whether it's a CPU or the, or uh, the APU, and then um, they're also uh, the same, whether it's an APU a monolithic uh, single chip solution or the new chiplet architecture that was um, introduced in, in Matisse. So um, it's, there's, a, there's a phenomenal amount of um, engineering and planning um, that goes to make sure that these products are, are compatible, socket compatible. So I think I think uh, actually um, even the last family of the previous. So prior to the Zen cores, we had the bulldozer um, family of cores, and I think the last product on the on the bulldozer family was also AM4 compatible. So basically, we are now a fourth generation uh, compatibility. So over four to five years of product, um, it's pretty cool. 
Shankar, what does the U or H suffix indicate in the part uh, number? Oh, so this one, um, so that's, that's uh, I think uh, uh, U stands for uh, lower power, so ultra low power, and then H is for higher performance, so high, slightly higher uh, power. So the U products will typically be in the like the thin and light kind of um, uh, laptops, whereas the H would be more of a desktop replacement type product. And then the G, um, that's for desktops. Um, sorry, I, I should have mentioned this, I, I forgot. Thanks for the question. And then there is a pro and a non-pro version. Um, and, the, and the pro uh, version has a few other things that uh, are required for commercial um, you know, um, uh, versions of, of these products. So um, different from the consumer line. Um, I don't exactly know what additional uh, things are required for the pro, but uh, there is a distinction. Any other questions uh, before we proceed? All right, so I'll talk about the, the uh, I'll give you a brief um, sort of uh, introduction to the, to the Zen uh, core family. Um, you know, so this is the one that really put uh, AMD uh, back on the sort of the performance, um, uh, you know, train. Um, uh, the previous um, bulldozer architecture um, we found had severe um, scaling um, limits. So if you see, um, we were on this um, slope, the red um, slope here, going from these different um, generations of the, uh, or what we call the, the bulldozer family, bulldozer, pile driver, steam roller, and excavator. And you can see the slope, um, uh, you know, was was you know relatively flat, uh, and we couldn't we couldn't uh, m make the performance go up um, if we were to continue on that uh, line. Um, and so uh, a few years ago, uh, you know, AMD's management made the decision that uh, uh, there was uh, this this architecture wasn't going to scale. And meanwhile, if you if you look, you know, Intel had a had a steeper slope kind of like this right and so uh, and with every passing generation uh, the gap between us and intel was um, was widening uh, and uh, and so the decision was made that that architecture uh, could could not scale uh, to be competitive and so uh, work started on a on a completely Brand new um, CPU core architecture, and the and the goal for this was was uh, was pretty big. Um, that uh, we improve performance uh, uh, about forty percent on a per clock cycle basis, but energy wise, um, we we stay at about the same as the excavator um, generation. So in terms of uh, per uh, per watt, uh, it's a massive um, increase. Um, of course, some of that um, power efficiency came from going to a different process nodes. So, um, you know, excavator was um, at uh, 20 uh, something nanometers and then going to Zen at 14. Uh, definitely um, some of the power efficiency came from process improvements, uh, but there was also a, a huge amount of design work uh, that went in um, to to make uh, to sort of meet these targets, um, and so uh, so once we once Zen based products came out, that's when um, the products became um, um, you know competitive and actually also started to beat um, Intel benchmarks uh, Intel uh, products in various benchmarks. So um, it's a pretty cool achievement. Um, so um, you know this is the the CPU core um, roadmap. Um, you know Zen and Zen Plus, uh, they were at 14 and 12. Um, Zen 2 architecture, which uh, got introduced um, uh, last year um, uh, with Matisse, um, that's at uh, that's at seven nanometers. And then uh, we have uh, future roadmaps for Zen 3 and, and Zen 4 um, in the coming years. Uh, and with with each successive generation, you know, we 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 continue to uh, have performance and power um, improvements. 
How small can the features get before you run out of? <laughs> that, that is the billion dollar question uh, already. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll talk about this. So that's one of the reasons why you know, um, at least AMD decided to move to this chiplet architecture because um, some things didn't quite scale the same way. And, um, and uh, you know, the cost of going to these smaller nodes is, is increasing quite a bit. Um, you know, seven nanometers and below, uh, actually seven nanometers, you can kind of, um, you don't have to go into uh, the step called uh, EUV, extreme ultraviolet lithography. Um, and, you know, from a physics perspective, that's a very hard problem um, where, uh, and, uh, and then manufacturing costs to create all those masks that go into um, the different layers of the chip. Um, costs are just exploding. Um, so um, I don't know. That's a, that's a that's a very good question. Um, you know, um, every time people have um, questioned uh, how much can it scale, p you know, s people smarter than I am have managed to find a solution. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can imagine uh, in a few more generations we'll get to the point where a transistor is nothing more more than a handful of you know silicon atoms. And then what? Um, don't know. It, it's a it's a it's a very interesting question. I, unfortunately, I do not have an answer. Um, but uh, currently, uh, you know, we are looking at um, seven nanometer plus, and then there is um, in the in the future um, uh, we're looking at you know five nanometers and stuff. So so at least at least there is there is some work going on already for 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 smaller nodes. Uh, when that will come, that's a, a, a different question also. Um, each, each transition is, uh, is getting more and more complicated. Um, you know, um, Intel has had issues with their 10 nanometers and um, it's really, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's not entirely surprising to people in the industry. It's, it's getting more and more complicated um, to go to these smaller smaller nodes. Okay, so um, here's a quick, um, you know, sort of a very high level overview of the Zen 2 architecture and uh, how, how that improved um, corresponding to um, uh, the previous um, Zen and Zen Plus um, generation. Uh, one of the big things that improved was the branch predictor. We uh, went to this new um, tag geometry branch predictor, um, which is a whole PhD thesis in itself. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but basically what branch predictor does is um, tell, tries to predict whether a particular branch is going to be taken or not, not taken. Um, and there are very sophisticated mechanisms to predict uh, what will happen. Um, uh, you know, in some case, for example, if you have a loop, you know, I equals one to a thousand and you're looping over something. So that branch that's at the end will be taken, you know, um, if it's, if your loop counter is a hundred, it'll be taken 99 times. And then the last time it will be not taken. So, uh, you know, you can, you can come up with a mechanism that says, okay, this branch is going to be taken more often than not. And so I'm going to predict taken and then I'll be wrong only once um, out of 100. Uh, but then there are more other sophisticated schemes that have tried to um, do that with the data as well and say, hey, can we even avoid that misprediction at the end? Because you know, as these pipelines get deeper and you're running um, all these instructions out of order, um, you need to have a very, very good branch prediction um, in, in order to not uh, waste uh, work and, and get maximum performance out of this pipeline. Um, the, the other thing that, uh, that brought us a lot of benefits in this generation was, in, uh, was uh, expanding this uh, micro op um, uh, cache uh, over here. So, uh, you know, x86 um, is a complex beast. Um, uh, you know, instructions can be anywhere from uh, one byte long to 15 bytes long. And so, you know, decoding takes quite a lot of effort. Um, so once we decode an instruction and break it down into, you know, more manageable uh, pieces, uh, more risk-like um, instructions, 
uh, we basically put that in the op cache so that if you ever go to that same instruction again, you don't have to uh, decode it again. And <clears> that's, a, that's a benefit both for um, uh, both from a performance perspective, as in you know decode takes longer, um, but also from a power because uh, you don't have to um, burn all this power decoding everything again. Right. Some so one of the hardest things is even finding where is the boundary of an instruction, um, and so uh, we save a lot of effort by caching um, um, uh, uh, instructions that have already been decoded. And so if you're in some kind of loop, uh, you get benefit of of hitting in this cache as opposed to decoding. Uh, and then this basically um, uh, allowed us to uh, reoptimize the um, L1 cache because um, uh, you know once if you know that a, for a particular instruction is already in the op cache you really don't have to go to the l1 instruction cache um, uh, to to get that um, instruction so you follow this path down rather than this path down and so um, so this all of this kind of um, got optimized um, um, together um, and then coming down to these um, um, you know, uh, ALUs, uh, we added additional capacity over here to so that allows us to uh, run uh, more instructions um, in parallel. Um, and then um, further down, I'll talk about the cache hierarchy, but um, the cache hierarchy also got um, improved. Um, and the thing that we um, carried forward was the um, um, SMT, which um, in uh, symmetric um, multi-threading, which um, Intel calls hyper-threading. Uh, so effectively, on a single core, uh, you could run uh, two threads um, in parallel. Uh, and there is like a, uh, a way to switch between those two threads, um, given uh, you know, what's, what's happening. So if one thread is stuck on a, on a load to memory that's going to take a lot of cycles, then the other thread can take advantage of all these execution resources uh, to speed up its execution. Um, you know, so there's, there's a, actually, if you, um, if you look online, there's a lot of information about um, Zen 2 uh, or Zen family in general that's already uh, available. So, um, um, you can you can look at all the improvements that uh, that have gone into um, this design, and this really incorporates uh, years of learning, um, and from both past successes as well as past mistakes. Uh, so um, uh, uh, with with these um, um, you know with the Zen uh, family, we've transitioned to. Um, uh, basically, building all of these as a as a CPU complex. So um, four cores is the smallest um, complex that we build, um, and uh, so you have four CPU cores, which is you know each core uh, looks like this picture, uh, um, oops. Uh, and um, it has its own um, um, L1 instruction cache and L1 data cache. And then uh, uh, each core has a, a 512 kilobyte um, uh, shared um, L2 cache. So all of this is kind of this picture um, over here. And then in the middle lives um, an L the L3 cache. And this the size can be different based on different pro products. Um, but the maximum size supported is um, 16 uh, megabytes. So these 16 megabytes are shared uh, by all the four cores um, in a complex. Uh, and then um, uh, for certain products, um, we uh, like for the chiplet architecture, we take two of the CCXs. So this this whole box here um, is, a, is we call it a CCX or, or a CPU core complex. Um, and we put two of them um, and then connect to them via uh, uh, what we call the infinity fabric. Uh, which is uh, an interconnect that connects uh, these two uh, pieces. So this whole thing uh, now um, is a single, what we call chiplet. So this, uh, for the Zen 2 generation, um, this chiplet is uh, basically eight cores. And since each core can support up to two threads, that's eight T or eight threads. So that's the nomenclature here, four cores, 
eight threads and you have two of them. So a total of eight cords, 16 threads in a, in a, in a chiplet die. And uh, so, so this is kind of the building block that uh, we use for a lot of our other products. Um, so uh, it's going into that chiplet design. So this CCD, which is the, the CPU um, um, chiplet, chiplet die. So this is this box over here. So we have that designed, um, and uh, that's um, currently at, at uh, seven nanometers for, for Zen 2. Um, and e each of these itself is fairly big chip, right? This, this chiplet itself is um, 74 square millimeters at, uh, at uh, seven nanometers. Uh, and then uh, what we do is we uh, pair that up with um, what we call the IO die or IOD. And there are two variants of this die. Um, either either uh, the client version or the server version. So, and then you combine these two in different ways to make a whole host of uh, products. So, ROM is our Epic uh, second generation Epic chip, and you can see um, these chiplets. The center one is this um, big um, server I/O die, and then you can count eight of these um, CCDs, so chiplets. So, so eight. So each chiplet, remember, is, is eight CPU cores. So if you have eight of them, um, you get 64 um, CPU cores, uh, 128 threads. So this is what our current generation server product, each, each um, product supports um, that many. Um, and then you can, you can then mix and match uh, these things in different ways. Uh, so Matisse, which is our desktop products, has two of these um, CCDs and a smaller um, client um, IO die, uh, and basically the the Infinity uh, product, uh, Infinity Fabric uh, ties all of these things together. Um, there there's versions of the fabric that are uh, die to die, so you know how the CCDs would connect to the IO die, and then there's a version of that within the IO die and CCDs um, themselves. Um, uh, and uh, so this basically uh, gives us full um, coherent access across all these different components um, on the die um, and then keeps um, you know latency from each cores uh, to be about the same uh, to, to, to memory. And the cool thing is that uh, this also enables us to uh, optimize each um, um, each um, uh, uh, you know, uh, block to its optimal technology. So CPU cores themselves benefit a lot from going into smaller geometries, whereas the rest of the I/O components. So by which I mean um, the the memory controllers, uh, PCIe um, I/O, um, and uh, and a few of these other components, um, they don't really benefit a whole lot from uh, from going down to smaller geometry. And um, and they are most a lot of them are analog components, and then uh, designing uh, and reliably productizing um, analog components uh, in smaller and smaller geometries is is more difficult. So by by using a more mature process for these components and a more cutting edge one for for the CPUs themselves allows us to uh, build a sort of best of breed products using these different um, geometries. And uh, um, um, as a as a company, uh, AMD doesn't own any fabrication. So um, breaking these units up in smaller pieces also allows us to choose the best, um, you know, uh, fab partner that is optimized for building um, these different uh, pieces. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, that this uh, chiplet um, architecture um, provides us. Um, and the other thing is uh, we also use some of these client IO die because it already has uh, a lot of components like um, like uh, PCIe and SATA, USB, all of this. We can take the same die and also use it to make uh, ch you know other chipset uh, pieces for the for the motherboard. So um, a really flexible way of designing uh, multiple products with relatively small component pieces. Um, and um, this is the this is what I was talking about. Uh, Matisse, which is our desktop product, um, it has a, 
uh, an eight thread, um, uh, eight core 16 thread variant, which is only with a single CC die, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, die. And then there's a, a there's a 16 core variant where which we can simply build by um, plopping two of these. Um, so desktop products um, that are not Threadripper are limited to um, 16 cores in the current design. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, based on manufacturing and everything, if, uh, if uh, certain cores within these dies uh, come out to be defective, then we can still um, uh, productize these parts as you know um, six core variants or or uh, you know some some smaller subset. Um, so um, it, it's a it's a it's a really flexible way of building um, all these products um, with these pieces. And then, like I said, uh, you can scale that up uh, to uh, to uh, server chips with way more um, CPU uh, cores. Any questions on this? Okay. Um, all right, so next let's talk about the uh, Matisse um, CPU design. Um, and this is, a, a this is a picture of the of the wiring that goes into the package. And so all these red dots that you see are the, the, the and some of these other dots here, those are the actual pins at the bottom of the of the CPU, and so to maintain uh, position of where uh, certain pins were in the previous uh, versions of the chip, all this routing in the in the package has to be very carefully done, so that these um, CPUs are socket compatible with um, with AM4. So this picture kind of just shows uh, the complexity that's uh, involved in the package substrate. Um, to uh, to achieve uh, this kind of um, complexity, uh, to to this kind of backward compatibility, um, this picture could have been very much simplified if we decided to break um, compatibility. Um, but um, one of the goals was to be backward compatible, and then we have to go through this complexity of designing such intricate um, routing on the on the on the substrate. Um, okay, so uh, what is Matisse? Uh, so this this is the 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 Ryzen three XSX series CPUs. Um, the, these got um, released, um, I think, uh, somewhere late last year, um, and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, 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 you know, like I said, it it can go up to two of these um, CCDs. Um, and each CCD is this picture that we saw before. And this bottom um, sort of dotted rectangle, that's the um, IO die. Um, and if you look at the IO die, it has uh, what I was talking about. It has um, two 64-bit uh, DDR4 uh, memory interfaces and the, the controller that goes with that. Um, uh, we already talked about this, the, the, the Infinity Fabric. This is the die to die portion of it, which um, connects to these two um, CCDs. And then there is the intro die fabric here um, that uh, connects basically all these different components together and lets them talk to each other or talk to memory or IO. Um, and uh, the, the fabric um, uh, is, is really um, uh, uh, sort of a, you can think of it as a, as a mini uh, network um, on the chip itself. So it has various, um, uh, depending on the product, we can choose what kind of topology that we want to use, um, you know, like a tree or a mesh. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we use that to connect um, all of these um, uh, pieces um, together in a, in a coherent uh, way. Uh, so a couple of other um, uh, major components, um, you know, uh, PCIe. Uh, so with this uh, generation, we switched to uh, PCIe Gen 4, uh, which is, uh, you know, doubles uh, the the per link bandwidth uh, from the uh, from the previous uh, Gen 3. Um, we have SATA and VME, um, the the USB 3.1 Gen 2, which is 10 uh, gigabits per second uh, bandwidth, um, and then 
um, this FCH um, has, um, you know, other um, uh, UARTs and GPIOs and, and a few other um, IO modules um, inside there. Um, sort of the, the system management unit, um, that is the, the central thing that controls uh, pretty much everything on it. And it's responsible for uh, all the, the clocking um, and uh, power management uh, and uh, um, those kinds of things which are central to this, this whole chip. So all the, the, the power governors and um, um, clock uh, management is all inside this, um, this unit. Uh, and then we have this platform security processor, uh, which um, implements uh, things like secure boot and uh, other um, security related features to, um, to, to guarantee that there is, um, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, there's no, nobody accesses memory that's not allowed to. So it, it enforces some um, gatekeeping um, internally. Um, and also manages some of the security keys. Uh, one of the cool features is that, um, you know, on a per um, uh, DRAM, so on a per page basis, right? So at a 4K granularity, uh, you can choose to encrypt um, the data with a, with a different sets of keys. So there's, I forget how, exactly how many keys uh, are available. So um, uh, for for applications that are secure and you don't want um, clear text data going out um, to your DRAM, um, there are encryption engines that are effectively embedded within these memory controllers, and so uh, data can be encrypted um, using you know AES um, encryption going in and out of the of the chip uh, to memory, and the and the, and the security processor kind of manages those keys and, and makes sure everything is secure. Uh, so, um, so these are some of the, um, some of the um, points. I think I've mostly, mostly covered um, mo uh, all of this. So DDR4, two channels, um, allows us a total of 51.2 uh, um, gigabytes per second of, of um, total uh, memory bandwidth. And then, uh, from a from a packaging and uh, and physical layer perspective, um, there is um, there is a lot of um, scope for overclocking, uh, which a lot of the um, enthusiast builders uh, want. So that was um, explicitly um, in the whole um, designed into this system management unit to allow for that um, flexibility as long as you know certain thermal conditions are, are maintained so we don't want the temperature of the die to become too high but within those limits um, you can you can overclock um, and then um, you know all these uh, different uh, units are actually clocked at different frequencies uh, based on whatever is optimal uh, for that or whatever is uh, required based on the current workload um, of the chip so um, most of these different units actually run at different clock frequencies, which means there's a lot of um, synchronization has to happen across all these boundaries uh, when we are moving data from one clock domain to another clock domain. Um, there are also voltage domains, so there is some voltage shifting that has to happen as well. Um, any questions on this? People still. Yeah. Oh, Shankar, everybody is uh, muted, so it might take them a okay. few seconds to unmute and figure out they're unmuted. All right. All right. That's that's a skill my eight-year-old is learning for for her schoolwork. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will keep going. Uh, like I said, feel free to stop me and ask questions. Um, so uh, this is the overall um, system connectivity. Um, if you think of this green box as the overall package, um, it has both the um, CCDs and the IO die. Uh, and then these are all the different interfaces that are, that are coming out of it. And um, you know, then these components externally uh, are would what would be on the on the motherboard. Uh, so this one does not have an integrated uh, graphics, so you will need um, 
a discrete GPU of some kind if you want to have a display. Um, and then you can drive HDMI or, or um, uh, display port uh, out of that. And then uh, the cool thing is that this link, given that now it's um, PCIe Gen 4, um, it's, a, it's a huge bandwidth um, upgrade. Um, the, like I said, the IO die that's within, within this package is also uh, reused as, as a chipset uh, to allow additional uh, IO uh, that is multiplexed over this um, uh, Gen 4 link. So you can have additional USB ports and, and um, SATA, Wi-Fi, uh, what have you uh, connected to these. Um, and the higher bandwidth of the Gen 4 link means that um, as long as you're not using all of them at the same time, you can you can get very good I/O performance um, through this chipset. And then yeah, you have memory and 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 some other USB ports that are already on the on the package uh, itself. Uh, so this is what uh, the uh, you know, but but um, o over time you can see the the number of components that are needed um, on a motherboard. Uh, are diminishing. Um, we're down to very few discrete components needed uh, to put together a working system. Um, these are some benchmarks. I won't go through this in more a lot of detail. There is um, there is a lot more of this uh, available if you go to your um, you know usual sources, Anantech or Foronix or any of these um, forums. Um, you will see, um, you know, a ton of benchmarks that are there um, already. Uh, but I just wanted to um, touch upon um, a couple of these things, which, um, uh, at least with the with these um, current generations, um, there is there's been a there's been a huge um, huge improvement. And so some of this just comes from having um, higher number of cores and threads um, in the in the system. Um, as you can see between between these two, so this is a Ryzen 7 versus 9, uh, and the difference is just the number of CPU cores. And and this one is the previous generation. So you can see there's um, there's a there's a 24% increase over the previous um, generation, keeping the thread counts the same. And then because now we have um, higher end um, uh, Ryzen 9 versions that have uh, that have the 16 cores um, enabled, uh, you get a much better, bigger jump um, in those. Um, and so these are some of the benchmarks that we see uh, that are um, significantly benefit um, uh, from, uh, from these. Um, and the other thing is uh, all of doing all of this, um, the power um, budget hasn't really gone up. So a lot of these benchmarks you can see were run with a 65 watt um, product uh, and that has remained the same over the generations and so what you're seeing here is a performance uplift at relatively constant power there might be a there might be a little bit up and down but uh, um, so in terms of uh, performance per watt these are these are huge improvements um, um, and this is specifically talking about the uh, benefits going from uh, from um, PCIe Gen 3 to Gen 4 over the previous um, generation. So, like I said, it's it's a um, theoretical bandwidth has doubled um, relative to the to the previous generation. So, if you look at um, um, you know discrete graphics tests uh, for for 3 d Mark PCIe, um, uh, you can see the, the the frames per second and the bandwidth has just um, is is way better than than before. Um, I mean, the theoretical bandwidth doubled, usable bandwidth uh, generally won't double because of some inefficiencies. But um, if you see these, these are still um, much huge improvements over the previous um, generation. And same thing with respect to, um, you know, storage. So if you have NVMe, um, Gen 3 versus Gen 4, again, very significant bump in, in um, uh, read and write uh, performance. So there are several other um, benchmarks and, and applications that, uh, if you rely upon a discrete GPU to do certain things, or you have other um, PCIe accelerators on your in your system, 
then there's a huge um, bump from from going to um, going to these um, uh, the faster bus speed. So I think that's all I had about Matisse. Uh, and the next one would be our um, um, new generation of um, APUs that was um, announced at um, actually at CES uh, this year. So these products are are just starting to um, hit the shelves um, in, in this first and second quarter uh, of this year. Um, so APU um, is um, uh, where we have both the CPUs and the GPU um, integrated. Uh, and this is, a, this is a, a single monolithic die. We have no chiplets um, um, involved over here. Uh, but uh, you know this is the this is the die shot, and you can kind of see um, that this has eight CPU cores. So these two, uh, this is one CCX, which is uh, four cores, and the L3 in between, and this is the other complex with another four CPU cores, and and it's um, L3. Uh, so you can kind of make these features out from the from the die shot, um, and I think these are the two. Um, memory channels and this is PCIe on this side um, and then this uh, all this stuff in sort of purple and this red over here this is all the graphics um, uh, inside and then on the side here I don't know which is which but you basically have um, display controller some other IO um, and um, you know uh, accelerators for video encode video decode etc so these these peripheral blocks on the side. So um, in terms of block diagram, this is what um, it looks like. Um, I just kind of pointed out we have we have um, eight um, cores, um, but for power reasons, we had to um, limit the the caches to uh, four megabyte per CCX. So eight megabytes um, total, uh, whereas the the desktop and and um, server variants would have um, uh, 16 plus 16 uh, up to 32 uh, megabytes but for for cost and power reasons because these are meant to go into um, you know uh, laptop uh, like factors um, uh, caches burn a lot of power so we have to limit that uh, but otherwise you know other than the l3 uh, l3 size this whole complex looks no different than uh, what was on the matisse um, product um, except that this is a, a, a this is a, a all monolithic. This is not a separate chiplet. Do you have an estimate of how many gates are on that chip? It must be a phenomenal number. It's huge. I don't remember. It's uh, um, let me see. So I think here oh. we had some estimate. Um, oh yeah. So <laughs> you can see this is two billion, and this is three point eight billion. Um, I don't remember exactly how much we have on Renoir because the, the GPU itself is pretty big. So I, I can look up the number for you. Um, uh, no, that, that's all right. I was just, yeah. You know, it's huge it's ball. huge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, so you can, you can look just for, so if you look at this um, um, server product, right, with, um, so it's eight times. Um, almost 4 billion there. So 32 billion for the CPU dies, and then another eight for the for the IO die. So a total of uh, 40 billion transistors. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, you know, each transistor is, uh, you know, if, if a uh, feature is seven nanometers, then it's a it's a small multiple of that, which is the feature size of a, of a typical transistor gate. So um, it's it's a it's a lot of circuitry crammed into uh, into these small small devices. I mean, the the area wise, you can see that's that's um, 74 square millimeters. This one is big, so the I/O die is pretty big because it has a lot of I/O um, associated, and those tend to use up a lot of um, area. Um, but then uh, the cut down version that we use for for client, you can see that's that's much smaller, uh, but still still a ton of transistors on there. Um, and then the the GPU is is huge, right? I mean, you can look from the relative um, area. 
So this this much is all CPU, and then it's about the same size uh, for all the for all the graphics uh, and multimedia. Actually, bigger if you include multimedia. So um, it's it's huge um, uh, in terms of transistors. I don't have the exact count for this product. Um, so. So yeah, so you have the CPU, and then below here in red is the is the Vega um, graphics uh, unit, uh, which uh, has um, eight of these um, CUs, uh, compute units, and those are the ones that are doing all the floating point calculations um, for uh, for the uh, for the graphics, and then um, the GPU has its own uh, one megabyte of um, L2 cache. That is that is uh, used only by uh, the graphics, but this cache is coherent with the CPU caches, and so you can you can um, uh, you can have workloads that um, you know uh, are doing compute on both the CPU and the GPU, uh, and then the data can be kept coherent um, between these two. Uh, and then um, the other thing that was not there on Matisse is the is the multimedia engine uh, and um, uh, you know this is responsible for um, the um, audio processing and the video both encode and decode um, supports a variety of different um, formats uh, to do the encoding and, and, and decoding uh, and then you know you have your usual um, set of IOs um, I just want to point out that the PCIe for this um, Renoir is only Gen 3. It is not Gen 4. Uh, and that was mostly due to for power reasons again. Um, and, the, and the fact that the, the biggest reason for needing um, uh, you know, higher speed is to support, um, uh, support uh, graphics, um, external graphics cards. But since this one already has internal graphics, um, the requirement for for faster um, PCIe is less, um, um, you know, given that these mostly go into laptop-like uh, form factors. So it was a power decision. Uh, and then you have uh, you have um, uh, uh, other I/O uh, similar to what was on Matisse. Um, you still have a connection to discrete graphics. So uh, for laptops that uh, uh, need a more graphics horsepower, you can still connect um, a discrete GPU uh, chip uh, to this. Um, the other thing that's different is the sensor fusion hub. And this has um, um, uh, you know, sensors in there like um, accelerometers and um, uh, gyroscopes uh, to do uh, so to allow for um, form factors like uh, these two in ones that are detachable um, desktop laptop slash tablet um, hybrids. So if you want to rotate your screen and have the have the um, display rotate, um, there's all these sensors in there that uh, that allow um, those kinds of uh, things. Um, so um, um, you can you can have uh, you can have those sensors um, in there, um, and then you have the display controller. So this is um, also built in, so that you can have your um, HDMI or Display Port coming out directly uh, from this chip. You don't need um, external peripherals uh, to be able to do that. Uh, but um, so sort of the main um, difference um, is um, now this Infinity Fabric and the and the memory controllers have a lot more arbitration to do, right? So so you have um, two of these um, um, DDR4 channels, and at 3200, uh, these two give you the same um, 51.2 uh, gigabytes per second that we saw uh, on the Matisse product. But now this has to be shared not just by the CPUs, but also by the GPU and the multimedia. So that's where some of the trade-off um, comes um, into the picture, um, where on, on, on the CPU products, if you look, uh, look at this one, um, the, the, um, 
uh, this memory is basically only mostly used by the by the CPU. And then you can have your discrete um, discrete GPU connected over PCIe, and this GPU would have its own frame buffer memory. So a lot of the graphics um, work will be um, uh, done uh, uh, by reading and writing to its own memory, and only data that has to be shared with the CPUs um, would would tr be transferred over this uh, PCIe link. So um, this uh, memory um, capacity and bandwidth um, uh, is mostly for use by the for the CPUs, and only a tiny fraction of that uh, would be needed by the GPU for um, data that's shared between the two. But uh, but in the in the Renoir case, uh, in the APU case, um, uh, this this memory bandwidth has to be used by by all of these. Um, and uh, from a from a design perspective, um, there is there is um, uh, you know a certain higher level of um, complexity. Uh, that that um, imposes because you have components like display and uh, multimedia. Uh, these are all uh, real-time um, clients. Um, so, you know, for example, if you have a 4K display uh, connected, um, so you you have to transfer, you know, uh, 3840 times 2160 pixels every 160th of a second, right? A assuming a 60, 60 hertz um, display refresh rate. Uh, and each pixel can be either four bytes or eight bytes, uh, depending on the formats. And so that's a, that's a lot of data that has to be sent out um, every second. Um, and uh, you cannot afford to mess that up, right? Because uh, same thing goes for, for audio. Um, that that much data has to be sent out guaranteed every every one sixtieth of a second for a frame, um, and so if the CPU and GPU are doing something busy in the background, um, that activity cannot uh, affect display. So um, this Infinity Fabric has a and the memory controllers have various uh, mechanisms for quality of service um, that are built in. Uh, uh, to to guarantee that some of these real time clients um, always um, get what they need, and then that the um, um, overall memory and uh, bandwidth as well as capacity is efficiently shared by everybody um, in the system. So, but but again, um, it it it, um, it maintains coherence as well as provides um, this kind of uh, quality of service uh, to across all these entities on the chip that have to talk to memory. Because even, even like um, your storage and everything, when you're reading data, those are effectively um, DMA, so copying data from the disk into, into memory uh, for use. So all of them uh, need access to the, to the, to the DRAM memory um, connected through this. So, uh, let me move on, and then if there's more questions, I can stop. Um, so this is just a comparison of uh, CPU performance uh, for for this um, generation uh, compared to the the, the closest uh, Intel product um, that um, is available today. Um, and so for for single thread performance, we are about parity, I would say. Uh, uh, but then um, you know, because now Renoir has eight cores and 16 threads, whereas I, I think this um, the this one is six cores, 12 threads. So so we have a, we have a, a thread advantage. So we get much better performance for for multi-threaded um, and graphics. Um, this is the top end graphics that Intel has in its integrated product, and uh, we are just significantly better in 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 graphics performance. Um, a lot of the other third-party, you know, benchmarking you will see also supports this. And I haven't looked at the prices, but I, I, I think the Intel chip is still more expensive than this one. Uh, so, uh, so overall, on 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 uh, performance, uh, you know, uh, uh, power and price, um, I think overall these products uh, are are phenomenally positioned. Um, relative to uh, where our competition uh, is. Uh, 
think this is my last slide here. Uh, so um, this is a comparison of uh, various uh, different uh, games uh, that are running on a laptop. Um, this is at uh, 1080p resolution and, and, and low settings, so not very high image quality, um, you know, uh, these. Uh, so for comparison, you know, um, we have uh, we have eight units um, on of computes uh, on this one, whereas a top end graphics card has 64 of them. So uh, so you cannot uh, you know expect uh, very very high quality uh, games at 4K resolution on these. But for a product that's meant to be in a in a laptop, you know, at a relatively low power, right, 15. 20, 25 watts uh, at most, um, you get pretty decent um, um, graphics uh, game game performance, and um, you know compared to the uh, compared to the the same um, Intel chip, uh, we are mostly on par or 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 better. Um, there's a few games um, that um, that you know you you'll see we're about the same. I would say. But then there are several other games where we are far better. And um, one of the other things that we have to, um, you know, AMD um, constantly has uh, to fight against is that um, a lot of the software is compiled for and optimized for um, Intel platforms. Um, and so, uh, you know, given the microarchitecture choices that Intel makes, um, they um, they you know they may not match what what we do, um, and so uh, oftentimes we see that if um, if the application is recompiled uh, for AMD with the AMD optimizations um, enabled, usually the performance um, is is better. Um, so that's that's another thing that uh, you know for for open source applications where where you can just recompile it yourselves. Um, uh, you know the difference is uh, you know you can you can work around that, but uh, for a lot of other commercial products, uh, we have to uh, we have that issue as well. Um, especially if uh, if those um, software vendors uh, choose to use the um, the Intel provided compiler. Um, I think. That was it. I think this is the fastest I've ever run through my slides for any BLU talk. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll stop here for questions. OK. Uh, there's a guy, Justiv, that's <clears throat> asking, is Ryzen going to have good free software drivers for graphics cards and Linux? And then he said, I always recall and sucking with regards to integrated graphics and free software drivers. So AMD, um, for the most part, the drivers are are completely open source. Um, so I think AMD still has binary blobs, but they're but they are mostly just built out of the um, the same open source uh, foundation um, as the rest. So um, you know. Um, uh, as as a company, I think there's been a lot of effort to to make sure that um, the the Linux uh, open source driver gets the same amount of love as the as the um, Windows um, counterparts. Uh, but often, um, at least in my experience, uh, you'll find that um, the Windows drivers get released first, and then and then the open source. Um, Linux drivers are generally, um, you know, a, a, a few weeks or months uh, behind. So typically, if you buy um, the the the, uh, especially for these um, uh, products with integrated graphics, if you buy a laptop just when these products come out, it's possible that um, your Linux um, graphics performance uh, may not be all that great because the drivers haven't been optimized yet. But typically, uh, once the um, uh, once the driver sources get patched um, into the main line, um, usually things are quite good. At least that's been my personal experience. I think Mad Dog wants to speak. Yeah, uh, in a lot of games, they use engines 
that are relatively small, but they do a lot of the work. And if you could get the game companies to compile only their only their engines or either make their engines open source and allow people to compile it, but better yet, give them the opportunity to compile their engines with your compiler that was tuned to your chip, you might see a considerable performance improvement on that. That's true, Mad Dog. Yeah, I mean that's a very good point. And 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 some vendors that uh, I mean uh, I, I don't have firsthand experience, but from from what I've heard, there are there are some vendors that AMD works with to um, to explicitly enable these optimizations for them, um, so that the 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 sometimes there will be uh, uh, the binary itself will detect what kind of um, CPU you have and then choose different libraries based on you know uh, which uh, which chip they've been compiled for or, or, or Intel versus AMD uh, so I, I know that happens for 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 at least some of these game engines I don't know if that happens to every single one and and to the sort of the higher level code that is written to work on top of these engines but one, one, um, you know, the, the one place where we have seen uh, benefits is because um, AMD products drive, uh, you know, uh, the 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 PlayStation and Xbox consoles. Um, a lot of other vendors have definitely, um, because they have tried to optimize the games for for those architectures. Uh, PCs also benefit from from those same optimizations. So we have definitely seen benefits from that side. Yeah, I was trying to address this specifically the gaming issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the game engines. I know, um, I know, AMD um, works with uh, with those game engine developer, Unity, Unreal, some of the bigger ones. Uh, I, I know, I know, AMD works with them. Actually, this conversation reminded me of of a story that. I've been telling on my Facebook uh, accounts about things that happened to deck and stuff. And this particular issue reminded me of one of the funnier stories. Please do share. Oh, well, okay. I'll be fine. <laughs> so once upon a time, uh, we had the X server, the X server had come out and, uh, you know, as you know, the X server was developed at MIT and, a bunch of people in the X server community and so forth. And we had some engineers inside of digital who continued to optimize the X server and stuff like that. So about the same time, and, and back in those days, the GNU compilers were only generating code that executed, it was, it took about a 30% performance hit on general code compiled by the GNU compilers versus that compiled by an optimi a good optimizing compiler like VAC-C. So the VAC-C people decided that they were going to put a lot of work into the VAC-C compiler to make it so that it was GCC compatible. So you could take GCC code and make it work on, with the, you know, compile it with the VAC-C compiler and get the optimizations out of it. So they, they did all this work and everything. They got it working. And then they decided to take, as an example of this, the X server and compile that and compare the performance improvements. And they, they did that, and they found out that they got absolutely no performance improvement. And they couldn't understand that. And they, they, they just, you know, so they went back and looked at it, and they, they looked at the source code for our X server, and it was just... Some of it was really twisted and warped. And so they talked to some of the engineers and they said, what, what's going on here? And the guy says, well, we know how GNU C generates code. So we twisted our C code to make this <laughs> the GNU compiler generate stuff that was very, very efficient for the X server. And so when the VAC C compiler saw this twisted code, it did its best but it was getting no better optimizations out of it than what the engineers were able to do. Now, of course, things have changed a lot in the meantime, and, and CPUs have gotten a lot more complex with multi-cores and things like that. So it would take a really, really, really good engineer 
to to do that on something as large as an X server, they probably would fail. So, <laughs> but it was an interesting story because they they really expected that the X server would be you know maybe ten percent faster or fifteen percent faster. Nothing. Hmm, interesting. I mean, speaking of compilers, I think um, AMD has um, uh, AMD's own compiler engineers have. Uh, done a lot of this optimization and um, um, contributed that code to both um, GCC as well as um, you know LLVM uh, Clang. Um, so a lot of these optimizations will make it into those releases. Oh yeah, and today, I mean, if you take a look between GCC and a commercial compiler, the the optimization that you can a good GCC uh, programmer will get out of the compiler with the proper switches, it's within the one to two percent issue, and sometimes the GCC is faster. Uh, I mean, I I can tell you out of experience that uh, uh, the compiler, I mean, GCC has become very clever. Where um, previously I could write um, I could write hand tuned assembly and beat GCC all the time. And now it's it's very hard, um, uh, I, you know. And and sometimes I, I want the compiler to do certain things, and it it it's just too good to optimize. And it realizes this all this code that I wrote is is doing nothing, and it just optimizes it away. Uh, whereas I just wanted to see what the assembly would look like, so I have to actually pass flags to prevent it from optimizing it and actually dump me some instructions, even though. The, the 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 net effect of all that code would be a big no up. Yeah, I had a project a while back when uh, Lanero was trying to move uh, a lot of code that was in Debian to a 64-bit AMD processor, and we found out there was about 1,400 files inside of Debian that had assembly language in them, and some of that assembly language was just god awful because what happened was somebody had written the program one time stuck some assembly language in it somebody else had come along trying to do a port never bothered to understand what the code was trying to do just basically mapped the new assembly language instructions into what the old ones did and it was pathetic and finally somebody would just kind of like Put a wrapper around it and say, "Hey, just just compile this," <laughs> <laughs> which of course increased the portability of the module. You know, if I had my way, nobody would write an assembly language. I mean, you should understand it, like like kind of like what you're doing. You should understand what's being generated, but actually um, doing that, you know, writing in it, it's just the, the lack of portability just drives crazy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, these days, um, I mean, other than, you know, system level code where you have to use certain very specific machine instructions um, uh, for most, you know, user level code, um, there's, there's very little reason to use um, direct assembly. I mean, uh, uh, at the at the most, you can you should use the 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 intrinsics for for various like uh, mul like the SIMD instructions and things have all got um, uh, GCC intrinsics. So um, you could use the intrinsics uh, and not really have to write assembly. Um, yeah, I, I was. I, I can't think of really. I can't think of any reason why user level code should be written in assembly. I, man, Doug, I agree, and I was one of the guys that wrote the assembler for the Alpha for Unix. It, it, it was a different as, time. as the Alpha, each little improvement in the Alpha, we had to make major changes to the code, the assembly code, until until they finally had out of order execution. That made it a lot easier, so we could ignore that code. Yeah. You know, I mean, what the, the other thing is, I mean, you compare the speed of a single core alpha to the, to the speed of a single core today. I mean, I remember a time where we didn't bother to set up interrupts because setting up the interrupts took more cycles than just looping until the, until the IO was done. 
Yep. You know, and after a while, the, the CPU is just so fast that you would go through so many loops and waste so many instructions. It was just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Shankar, can you talk about the errata that creeps in inevitably with all <laughs> billions of gates and the verification process? Are you able to make fixes with microcode up updates? Or? Um, in some cases, um, yes. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Give and, and but then a lot other stuff has has gone into the design to allow for certain level of um, redundancy. Um, and and then product sort of product binning strategy. So uh, for example, um, you know a lot of these caches, um, we say you know we have um, you know uh, let's say 32 kilobytes. Um, the the actual size of the array will be 32 kilobytes plus a few um, extra redundant lines. So during um, after manufacturing, when we get the parts back, um, you know you can find that there are some um, um, you know, um, defects um, in the chip. So you might have some memory elements, you know, stuck at zero or stuck at one or, um, you know, those kinds of faults uh, because of some micro short that has happened. Uh, and then um, our, our test patterns will detect that and then say, okay, this line or this column of this array is bad and map that to to one of the other redundant rows or columns that is not bad. And so you still get the full capacity, um, you know, the, but, uh, uh, but you've worked around this, uh, this defect. So obviously that does involve um, a little more design complexity um, and, uh, you know, a little bit of extra area on the chip um, to, uh, to ensure uh, these kinds of things. Uh, but uh, the trade-off is 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 well worth it, um, and verification-wise, yeah, it's it's a it's a very complex you know complex uh, problem. Um, the the number of engineers involved in in verifying all of this, starting at the basic component level uh, or like unit level tests to um, integration tests and beyond. Um, it's a massive amount of effort to to make sure that even logically everything is working fine. And then there is a whole other aspect of once those uh, those logic gates are translated into actual transistors and um, placed and and routed as far as um, a floor plan goes. Um, there's a, there's a whole another level of complexity. Um, but for these products, you know, but some of these things. Um, you know, um, if I, if for example, in um, for this um, this product here, um, if we find that uh, you know certain CPU is just not behaving correctly, uh, we can uh, we can disable um, uh, typically in pairs. We'll disable two of them, and then can sell this as a you know six core part instead of an eight core part. Um, and still be able to salvage, uh, you know, a good chunk of of the of the die. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and 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 as we go to these uh, smaller geometries, um, you know, some of the initial um, yields, uh, and by yield I mean if you make a wafer with a hundred dies, how many good working products do you get out? Um, that number can be can be very poor at the beginning, and there's a lot of optimization that has to be done uh, to get it um, to get it um, you know uh, to good shape uh, but then I think the other part that you were referring to were just logic bugs right which is which is not um, any um, defect in manufacturing but fundamentally um, we had a, a bug in the design um, um, that's causing something to misbehave um, and yes, some of that we can patch um, using um, using the, the the microcode. Um, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, there are some other things that cannot be patched, and uh, you have to um, issue an um, you know erratum for that and suggest some kind of software workaround, which typically comes with um, either a performance penalty or a power penalty or sometimes both. Um, and uh, yeah, those those have to go along with the documentation for any product. 
you have to be bug for bug compatible with Intel. <laughs> Not necessarily. Uh, um, some of the so for uh, if you go back in history when when AMD was just a second source for for Intel products, right? The three eighty six, for example. In the in those cases, yes, you had to be um, bug for bug compatible. But uh, but these days, um, you know, um, higher level architecture. There's a lot of sharing that happens between the two companies. Um, obviously, we don't want um, completely divergent set of instructions, um, at least user level instructions uh, between the two companies. But uh, we don't necessarily have to have the same bug. As long as all these things are documented correctly and compilers know how to how to work around those things, I think we're okay. You know, I have, I have a question on um, on the Matisse architecture. I think you were saying, if I understood you correctly, that there is hardware AES that encrypts back and forth to the local RAM, um, as opposed to just you know having the usual AES. And I extensions. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the performance penalty for that? And what is the selection of chips that have that? I mean, I, I don't think the Renoir set would have that. Um, I'm not sure about Renoir. The desktop and server chips uh, definitely have that capability, um, and some of it has to be enabled by the the, the software. Um, uh, but uh, but uh, the 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 way, yeah, there is a penalty. Uh, because uh, now there is um, extra latency um, to go through all the encryption decryption steps. Um, I don't know the exact uh, magnitude of that. I'll, I'll have to um, uh, look into that data. I don't have it off the top of my head. But it's 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 relatively small. It's not huge, uh, but it's uh, but it's still nevertheless there there is a penalty in doing that. Is that commonly used by uh, off-the-shelf operating systems? Um, I believe no. Most of our server customers, I think, do enable that, but uh, and uh, um, that that um, is also enabled by default for all of our console products. I'm sure our our, our console customers um, do that, uh, but uh, uh, I think by default most desktop products don't today. And, uh, and at least for some products, I know this is an option in the BIOS. Um, I haven't looked into it. I, I, I don't know exactly how these get enabled. If it's there is, I'm sorry. Uh, but there's a, there's a hardware component as well as a software component to it, obviously. Um, so if it's enabled in, in, in BIOS, is it then transparent to the operating system? No. Uh, operating system still has to... Um, uh, know about this and uh, at least um, for for virtualization each guest needs to be aware of this uh, so there's there's a few steps here I, I actually that's a, I don't know the entire set of details on on how um, for example Linux would enable it I, I can I can check that for you uh, it's pure curiosity I, I, I don't think mm -hmm. it has a ton of uh, practical value to me anyway but it, it is interesting yeah, I mean, this is this is uh, this is uh, more for um, you know um, uh, for for things that you don't want somebody to snoop on the bus, right? If you just attach some probes on the on the DDR interface and and you wanted to grab sensitive data uh, that way, um, this is a way to prevent prevent that from happening. Understood. But it's mostly used in server platforms and things like that. That. Like I said, our, our, our console customers most definitely enable that feature. Um, they don't want any game content or other, um, uh, other secrets uh, to be grabbed by looking at plain text data going over these external interfaces. All right, thank you very much. Sure. More questions? Sounds like that might be it. I don't see any messages coming across. 
Would you like another assembly language story? Sure. Sure. Okay. So time went on, and the VAX architects, and the VAX, of course, was a very complex instruction set. The VAX architects figured out that if they could eliminate just one of the addressing modes, that they could reclaim a lot of the, circ a lot of the uh, circuitry in a chip. So they decided to go around to all the different compiler makers and look at all the compilers and see if those compilers generated, ever generated that addressing mode. And they found out that, gee, none of them did. And they got to Ultrix, and we and Ray Lanza, a very good guy, looked at the uh, GCC compilers and said, no, they don't generate it either. And for some reason, Ray decided to copy me on this letter. And I took one look at it and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about the people who write in assembly language? And sure enough, we found a couple different applications where the applications had written in assembly language. I said, well, and these are the ones that we found. So when you're, when you're creating an architecture, you have to be really, really careful about creating those extra instructions, extra addressing modes, and so forth, because once you have them, it's really hard to get rid of them. <laughs> that's a very good point, Mad Dog. Uh, I have I have one anecdote that's that's related, and I don't know to what extent this is true, but um, supposedly um, a while ago uh, there was um, you know I think both AMD and Intel uh, <clears throat> talked about um, whether it was finally time to retire all the 16-bit cruft that's hiding in, in you know in in, in x86, um, and. Uh, they said, let's, you know, geez, if we just drop 16-bit mode, you know, you could you could cut down a lot of this complexity. Um, and um, from what I heard, there were certain um, three-letter government agencies that basically <laughs> said, no way. If you if you did that, we will stop buying all your products. So uh, so that option supposedly was shelved uh, because of that. Yep. Uh, yeah, and uh, and that's that's uh, one of the challenges where where you know as we march forward through all these technology um, nodes and and having more and more features, we simply cannot afford to drop any of these um, um, features that um, Intel decided were necessary in 1976. It's one of the arguments of risk technology versus CISC technology, that the compilers, you know, the instructions themselves are so simple and, you know, so basic, and that you move the complexity into the compilers. And, you know, that's 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 an argument that we could probably have, it's just like microkernels versus monolithic kernels. Mm -hmm. Where's Andy Tannenbaum when you need him, right? <laughs> yeah, no, th those are age old age old um, um, things. Um, uh, I, I know Vax famously had an instruction that could uh, compute an uh, nth order polynomial. I think it was order eight? Maybe Mad Dog, you know. Um, no, I, I, I never really, is, I hate to admit this, I never really is studied the Vax instruction set that much. I was more of an IBM man when it came to assembly language and PDP 11s. Jerry, how about you? Do you remember such an instruction? I think you could compute like A um, X to the power eight plus B X to the seven and so forth. Uh, no, I, I can't. Uh, I did, uh, I was around for the alpha when the alpha of course was using the uh, IEEE uh, format for floating point and of course vax had a whole bunch of different floating point modes and a lot of people really did not like that well i mean the vax with the vax architecture was set up yep. before the ieee standardized on the yep. floating point so that's correct what could you do right that is true 
I mean, yeah. and even now there are new formats. So there's a, there's a, for a lot of these machine learning where, uh, you know, you don't need a very high level of precision, uh, but you need to do a lot of these inference calculations very quickly. There's new formats that uh, um, are coming up where like, you know, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's not life or death if you once in a while misclassify a dog as a cat, right? So they're willing to take that lower precision uh, for a lot of these kinds of applications. So there's, there's even new formats coming up even now. Um, well, I mean, there's, I mean, there was always the argument of how much precision can you make, be, can you, do you need, because you can only machine or build something to a certain precision. You know, what, what good does it do to, to have, you know, 29 decimals of precision when you're building a bridge, when you can only get the bridge accurate to within, you know, three or four digits of precision? Right, right. Well, that'll cost you on some like finite element analysis where you're doing iterative processing and something like a bridge is going to depend upon the ability to do that with at least measurable guard digits. So that can mess you up pretty badly. And that was one of the, the key motivations for, you know, IEEE 754. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's nuclear reactors too, right? You're, where like either you're critical or you're not critical and, you know, 0.99999, you're, you're not critical and 1.0001 you are. And so that, you know, those kinds of precisions matter a lot in those things, but, but, you know, for those, they use the, the most advanced uh, formats possible and um, speed is, is less of a concern there, like a, a speed of computation, I mean. Yeah, well, I did some other stuff with floating point and we had a lot of problems with the normal rounding. Yeah, but a lot, of, a lot of these things are why you move this specialized stuff outside of the core instruction set. Yep. And you then say the core instruction set is what we're going to guard with our life. It's never, you know, that's the thing you really have to depend on is, is, is what just is in your boot path and everything else. And everything else you can have in the extended instruction set, which you can change from time to time and architecture to architecture. Yeah, that's where we have the problem is in the uh, denormal handling on the alpha. I remember one time... Uh, it was with Unix, and Unix was mostly an integer operating system and had very little, very, very little, or in some cases, no floating point in it. Um, you could you know, do floating point in your in your applications and stuff, but not in the operating system itself. Yeah. And on the VAX 11780, the only way you could tell whether the floating point accelerator was working was to time how fast it did a series of floating point calculations. And if it did it in a certain period of time, you knew that the floating point unit was fine. And if it didn't, you knew the floating point unit was broken. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Well, even on the Z80, um, timing was critical because you know even on the, these 8-bit CPUs from the 1970s, you had to be concerned about the path of execution on branch. And one of the things that actually had to be hand coded in assembly mm -hmm. was if you needed all of your paths, regardless of branch, to take the same finite amount of time. And for something like machine control or um, real world IO, like you were trying to synthesize a UART or a USART or do something like IBM BiSync or X.25, you had to at least hand code the core of that to make sure that the difference between a branch taken and a branch not taken didn't mess you up. So there's a long, long history of that, even on very simple stuff. Yeah, but I think many people on this call can remember the fact that when the 3D6 first came out, you had the 3D6 chip and it didn't do floating point but you could get the accelerator chip and plug it into the board. And after a while, Intel said, man, so many people are doing that. It's kind of ridiculous to force all of them to do that. I mean, that's, that's the march of technology, right? As, as you can, as you go to these smaller geometries, you can, you can do more and more of this integration. Um, 
because you have the transistor budget to 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 do that. So yeah, so 386. I think even early versions of the 486 had the SX and the DX, and I think the difference there was whether it was integrated or not. Um, uh, and the, the, so you had to buy a separate 387 um, coprocessor for floating point um, because the the onboard one basically used um, integer math to do floating point in a very inefficient way. Um, well, in the original 386, the distinction in the SX and DX was the physical bandwidth to memory and the addressability. So the 386 SX could only address a maximum of 16 megabytes because it used the, the 286 uh, form factor. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When they, they, but originally SX and DX stood for single and double, which makes intuitive sense. Mm -hmm. But then when they went to the 486, um, they had the same memory bandwidth, but the 486 SX had the disabled coprocessor. It was basically a 486DX that had flunked uh, coprocessor verification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted uh, the full coin coprocessor in addition to the 486SX, you had to buy this thing called a 487 chip, which you know, by analogy to the 387 math coprocessor um, gave you the combined capability of a 486DX, which had an embedded coprocessor. And uh, you know, if, if you had a 46SX, then you, your motherboard had to have a 47 socket, which almost none did. So that was a total disaster and failure. And, and <laughs> yeah, I don't think they tried that again in any subsequent chip. Every, as far as I know, every Intel CPU after that had a, had included floating point coprocessing. I think so. Yeah, from from Inclu penetration included uh, included in floating that. point. Uh, firmware bugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fairness, if you're going to have firmware bugs in anything, it's going to be floating point. I mean, that's extremely touching. I mean, a friend of mine once found a, uh, a bug in the GNU C library for Cosine. And I remember he spent an entire day because he couldn't believe that there was a bug in the GNU C library for Cosine. And if there was a bug, he couldn't believe he'd found it. But but after about a full eight hour day, he, he convinced himself, yes, yes, this is a bug. And he reported it and they said, yep, that's a bug. Wow. Well, that brought us up another story. When we were doing Alpha Linux, uh, DEC had a math library, the math library in, in in Lit Unix, that they'd done a lot of work on. They'd hired a mathematician to go through the math library and write the math library to be very, very, very efficient for the alpha processor. And while DEC was willing to contribute the math library in binary form to Alpha Linux, they weren't willing to donate it uh, in source code form because they said, hey, if we do that in Sun Microsystems, we'll see all the improvements we made and they'll be able to improve their speed of their math library. So I was being beaten up on one side by the Linux people saying, why can't we have the source code? And being beaten up on the other side by DEX saying, no way in the world. So I finally turned back to the Linux people and said, if you guys just think you're such hotshot programmers, why don't you write a better one? And there was silence on the other side of the internet. And then a couple of days later, all of a sudden, I get this email that says sine is 3.5% faster. A couple of days later, cosine is 2.7% faster. And subroutine by subroutine down the math library, they made it faster than the, than the deck library was, except for one subroutine. And I said, why doesn't that one get any faster? And they said, because nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> nobody nobody really uses it so nobody's, nobody's gonna put the time in on it okay i wish yeah. you could remember what that function was yeah i, I can't i can't I, I i i just i can't i just i've tried in the past i don't want to say what it what it is because i might get it wrong but you know if he could remember that would prove that it was false no, I, <laughs> I was the, i was the liaison to the uh math group in from the uh, development environment group. Uh, and that was my punishment. 
shortly after I joined the development environment group. What, 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 what group or, or what, what company or what punishment? A deck. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was Jim McHale who uh, punished me. I've known Jim for a long time. Did you, you know Jim, didn't you? The name's familiar, but you know, quite, it was 30 years ago. Yeah, it was quite a few years ago. But uh, one of the problems that we had was that there were competing standards for Unix. Hmm. And with the math library, it was a problem because the error, error nodes were different between hmm. the uh, Unix standard or the OpenX st standard and the uh, System 5 standard. And essentially what would happen is that uh, we get the math library and we'd put it through the standards test. And so the uh, X open standard would pass it, but it would fail the uh, system five standard. Hmm. And we, I get a lot of cars from that. And then I talked to the math group and they beat me over the head and said, no, we're not going to fix that because Finally, we had to get the standards people together and get a waiver for it. So does this mean that System 5 was not well, Unix system compatible? Yeah, well, we, we, had to, we had to be compatible. Yeah, but I mean, so if the X Open, X Open eventually owned the standard for defining yep. what Unix was. Yeah. And so if System 5 couldn't pass the test suite for X Open, then they couldn't call their system Unix. Yeah, we know. But uh, we had to pass both System 5 and X Open. Yeah, well, the thing was with the Linux people, that was a lot easier for them because they weren't claiming to be Unix. They just said, okay, we need to have yep. the the – you know, the alpha version to be compatible with the right. Intel version, right? Yeah, but I was in the Unix group at the time. Yeah. So, And the issue was that the uh, System 5 people were out in New Jersey. Yeah. And the uh, XOpen people were in um, Nashua. Yeah. In Spirit Road. So for another issue that we had was um, with the the time the time T issue, thirty two bit issue uh, with uh, twenty thirty eight. Yeah, the clock turning over. We one of the standards. Uh, one of the standards actually failed because of that. And it was a bug in the standards test. But they go 50 years out. And of course, we were about 50 years out. Uh, we have some messages here. I have, don't see them. Oh, Shankar answered some of the things. Shirley Dulcie. Shankar answered him. But yeah, that we had to get a waiver and get them to actually fix the standards test. But that actually uh, caused us to, let, to delay a shipment. Anyhow, we're reminiscing here. Oh, we should have a reminiscing night. Yeah, <laughs> we could do that. We could have people, we could, you know, we could give little entries about the things we want to reminisce about and mm -hmm. put that into a, a, a list and then have one time where people come in and the people that made the submissions can reminisce about them and then people can throw their own stuff in there at the same time. Yeah, That's a great idea. Yeah, but the problem is it would be like hours and hours and hours. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I, I I I remember the time we stole a whole pallet of beer. Uh, 
All right. Well, I'm, unfortunately, I have some other things I have to do tonight. So nice. Having, nice. Thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Shankar. Thank you. I was I was reminiscing to myself that I remember the time I built a very large logic gate out of relays, but 42 billion relays would cover the state of New Hampshire and need the Hoover Dam to, to power them. So. <laughs> How about fusion understand. power? Yeah, at, at least in the winter, New Hampshire would be able to cool them. <laughs> uh, talk about global warming. All right, good night, everybody. Okay. okay good, night. Thank you. good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I'm going to shut down the um, live streaming now. The shut down on the YouTube end first. Yep. I'm just hoping your statute of limitations had run given